So I had an interesting conversation last night. Every, um, every other week, typically, I meet with a, a group of guys from the gym where I lift weights. And uh, we, we, according to one guy's work schedule, we get together every other week for a couple hours and um, just sit around and, and talk and, and do Bible study and just see how, you know, try to lift each other up, encourage each other. And uh, so last night we were talking about uh, this very thing, not the same scripture, but uh, you can go ahead and turn to the Gospel of Mark if you want to find that in your Bible. Mark chapter 12, I'll go ahead and give you that. Mark chapter 12 is where we'll be tonight. But we were talking last night, it was five of us there, and just talking about um, worship and how it's not just what we do on Sunday, but it's how we live during the week and how we honor God in in everything we do, or at least that's our goal, right? I mean, we, we all fail and fall short, but we try to live in a way that represents Jesus. That's That's the goal. So it's not just a Sunday morning thing or a Sunday night thing or a Wednesday night thing. It's, it should be a consistent thing. That's, that's our goal. And so we were talking about that last night, about being different. And that if we're, if we're living our lives and we're out in the world and nobody can tell anything, this, nobody can tell there's anything different about us at all compared to anybody else, then that could be a problem. Right, Because we're supposed to be different. We're supposed to not just blend in and look like every other person on, on the earth because uh, not everybody's trying to live for Jesus. And so if we're trying to live for Jesus and then our neighbor is not, and then people that look at both of us can't tell the difference, then that's a problem. So I kinda, that kind of led me back to this familiar passage because there's another one in Matthew that's kind of a parallel to this one, but... Tonight, in Mark 12, uh, from verse 28 to verse 34, it's just a little paragraph, a couple little paragraphs here, but it's about priorities. And I thought about it in terms of this church, our church here, uh, we all have the same mission, but everybody's got a unique vision. So let me explain that for just a second. Um, Every church that follows the Bible, that follows Jesus, has the same mission, and that is make disciples right the great great commission that's our mission all right but then every church has a unique vision of how that's going to work out because every church is unique it's in a unique location with unique people different gifts and abilities different resources and so god puts all those things together so uh, a vision can be unique to a singular group of people while the mission is going to be the same does that make sense? Great commission, everybody does that. So I got to thinking about our vision, about loving God and loving people and making disciples. That's a, in general terms, that's our mission. That's our vision. And we have to figure out how we work that out here where we are. Loving God, loving people, and making disciples. So here's, here's um, what I thought about relative to this passage of Scripture tonight. Have you ever come into a conversation and you think you have everything you need as far as information, you think you know what you're talking about, but then as soon as as you start talking a little bit, you realize you either were unprepared or misinformed or you don't have enough information like you thought you did. You thought you were going to come in here and you knew what you were talking about and then you start talking to the other person and next thing you know, they uh, know more than you do and then you're kind of at a loss. And it might be embarrassing, uh, but, you know, when, when you find yourself in that awkward position of coming in confident and then all of a sudden not so much, and then, then you're kind of looking for a way to get out of a conversation, you know. And so kind of like that, similar to that, is what happened here in this little conversation that Jesus had. Because a group of these chief priests, these scribes, elders, They were questioning Jesus, but they weren't getting anywhere. And he told a parable against them specifically. And so they all left. All right, well, then uh, they sent some Pharisees and some people from Herod to try to trap him in what he said, and they were unsuccessful as well. 
In fact, they were utterly amazed. They were just they were in awe of what Jesus was able to say and, and what he knew. So finally, some Sadducees, the, the distinction there, Sadducees and Pharisees are very similar, but the Sadducees don't believe in a resurrection. That's, that's the difference between those two groups, one of the main differences. So they came and questioned him about, oddly enough, about the resurrection. And he told, uh, he told them they were mistaken because they didn't even know the scriptures. And they didn't know the power of God. And he, he kind of embarrassed them. So after all these different groups of people tried to expose Jesus as a false teacher, which of course he was not, then um, they all proved to be failures in their quest. But then a single scribe came up to Jesus and asked him a question. And that's the question we're going to look at tonight. Mark chapter 12, beginning in verse 28. And here's, here's what the, the story looks like. One of the scribes approached. When he heard them debating, saw that Jesus answered them well, he asked him, which command is the most important of all? And Jesus answered, the most important is... Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other command greater than these. Then the scribe said to him, You're right, teacher. You have correctly said that he is one, and there is no one else except him. And to love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is far more important than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. Now when Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And no one dared to question him any longer. Now to me, this is kind of, it's, it's kind of like comic relief. You know, it's, it's not a, a, a funny story, but there's some parts of it that are a little bit humorous. Because how many times does Jesus have to answer well before people start to get the, get the, the, the drift here that he knows what he's talking about, he is who he says he is, and they need to, instead of trying to come up with some trap, they need to listen to what he says. So in this little passage, you have a question, an answer, and then you have some observations uh, from different perspectives. You have an earthly observation and a heavenly observation. And so looking at this passage, the first thing that comes is the question, because I, I kind of gave you a little background about all these groups that were questioning Jesus. And then this one scribe comes up and asks this question about the most important commandment. So... The question he's asking is not necessarily the most important commandment, but rather which commandment supersedes everything and is over everybody, not just uh, God's people, but Gentiles, everybody. Is there a commandment that covers all people? And so that's his question in verse 28. And he, he, you can tell, you ever ask somebody a question when you think you already know the answer, you just want to see what they'll say? So it's kind of loaded, you know, and you're, you're kind of, and even that is kind of a trap. It's like, I know, I know what they're supposed to say. Let me see what they really say. Well, that's kind of what this guy was doing. He kind of had that attitude because he was one of those in the group, the scribes, uh, that hung out with the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. So he was in that same group. So when Jesus answers, he gives him two statements and then two commands. So the first statement is uh, out of Deuteronomy. Listen or hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And then that comes a command right after it. And if you remember this, uh, if, you were to, if you were to turn, this is called uh, the Shema. This is like a, uh, one of the most important things in uh, Old Testament teaching from the, the, the people of Israel. Deuteronomy chapter 6, let me turn back to it so I can read it from there. 
Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These words that I'm giving you today are to be in your hearts. Repeat them to your children. Talk about them when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you rise up. Bind them as a sign on your hand and let them be a symbol on your forehead. Write them on your doorposts of your house and on your city gates. So that gives you a bigger picture of really how important this is. What they said to the people of Israel was, this is so important that you, this is what you always need to be talking about. This is what you always need to be thinking about. You need to write it all over the place. So everywhere you go, you'll see this you know, on your, you know, the, the Israelites, uh, some of them, they would carry these little pouches that had little pieces of scripture in them. So, and they put them like on a band, wear it as like a headband with a little pouch in it or on, a, on their hand. And so when you hear that in Deuteronomy, that's what he's talking about. Carry that stuff with you. It's almost like what our, um, our counterpart to that would be, don't leave the house without a Bible. Make sure you, if you can't, I mean, obviously you, we like to memorize scripture. That's always good to have it in your heart and mind. But take a, have a Bible with you. So if you forget or if you need to reference something and somebody's asking you a question, you can say, just a second, here's, here's the Bible. Here's what it says. And that way there's no doubt. And you, they, they don't have to wonder, well, is that really what the Bible says? They're just making that up. No, you can just hear right here. You, you read it, you know, that way. You can always have it there uh, in, in, when you need it and have other people see it for themselves. And that way they, there's no um, break. And I would use the example like the break in the chain of evidence. You know, that way there's no question if it's true or not. Okay? They see it for themselves. So the first statement is uh, he quotes from Deuteronomy. And then the first command is, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. So that passage, it, they recited it. It was so important. Every morning, every evening. It was like a, a creed that they would repeat. It was a summary. And it was uh, just as important to Judaism as maybe the Lord's Prayer would be to us. Or the Apostles' Creed is something that, that uh, a lot of Christians will repeat. It talks about God being the one and only. And it talks about uh, not just God or Lord of Israel, but every individual. And so because God, we go back to who he is. He's creator, so he has authority. And he's authority over everybody. So that's what we're talking about in that first command. So this is important because this is how Jesus is answering this man's question about what is the most important commandment so then you get uh, the second command and then the second statement in opposite order so after he says love the lord your god with all your heart soul mind and strength then he says and love your neighbor as yourself now the second statement now we know those right that's that's what we call the great commandment okay so if you want to in fact you could go out on the church website our church website and you could look at uh, the front page, what, what, do, what do we think or do as a church? And you'll see the Great Commission, the Great Commandment. You'll see these exact things. This is what, we, uh, this is what drives us, right? We want, we want to love God. We want to love our neighbor. We want to make disciples because that's what the Bible tells us to do. It's the Great Commandment and the Great Commission. So the interesting thing here is after he gives these two commands, the second statement it's kind of a odd thing. In verse 31, the end, he says, there's no other command, singular, greater than these. And that's plural. So, that, so what, what does that exactly mean? So you, you see that there is um, a link. It's almost like one presupposes the other and vice versa. Like they go together. You can't, you can't do one and not do the other. Do you remember? I, I, hadn't, I didn't write this down. I hadn't planned to, to say it. But do you remember in the New Testament where I believe it's 1 John. And I believe it's 1 John 4. 
I, I'm not finding the exact verse right right away, but it's talking about how uh, if you say you love your brother, you say you love God, but you don't love your brother, then you're a liar. Because how can you love God who you can't see when you can't love your brother who you can see? And that's that's a paraphrase of that scripture. And I'll, I'll have to go back and find it. But I'm pretty sure it's in First John. But the point of that is, if you love God, you will love your neighbor. If you don't love your neighbor, you can't say you love God. And so that's why this, this singular command contains both of these commandments. So it's the fact that Jesus adds this commandment, which actually goes back from uh, Leviticus 19, which all those laws, you know, every time we read through the Bible, we get to Leviticus, and it's like, oh, man, I, I can't wait to get through Leviticus because that's some tough reading sometimes, you know. Uh, when you're reading through the Bible. But it takes both of these commandments to realize the one will of God. So if you think about not separating one from the other, so that's why when Jesus says there's no command greater than these, because uh, you have to have them both. So whoever doesn't find the source of love in God is going to fail to exhibit God's love to their neighbor. So the, the love we have for God is prior to the love we have for our neighbor. And it's actually what makes our love for our neighbor possible. The more we love God, the more able we'll be to love our neighbor. Right? This, it, they go hand in hand. So the scribe asks the question. Jesus gives the answer in these two statements and these two commands. Then when we get to verse 32... We have some observations. The first one is from an earthly point of view. So the scribe, trying to maintain his uh, self-righteousness, I suppose, he observes Jesus' answer, and he judges Jesus' answer to be correct. Now, isn't that funny? Some, some dude's going to tell Jesus, well, good job. And I'm, you're going to get a gold star today, Jesus, because you actually gave the right answer. Like, like he wasn't going to know his own word that he inspired, right? So he says, you're right, teacher. Literally, it says, well said. And then he summarizes the answers. You see, he kind of tries to repeat. It's almost like he's trying to make himself seem more important. And he says, you've correctly said that he's one and there's no one else except him. And verse 33 says, to love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your strength, and to love your neighbors yourself is far more important. And then he brings up this statement. They're far more important than burnt offerings and sacrifices. Now, that is another throwback to the Old Testament. Because, gosh, I, I should have written all these down, but they're all coming to my mind all at once. Uh, when, you, when you look at, I think it's 1 Samuel 15. There's a, a verse in 1 Samuel yeah, I got one right. First Samuel fifteen twenty two, Samuel said, Does the Lord take pleasure in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? And then he says, To obey is better than sacrifice, and to pay, uh, to give heed is better than the fat of rams. So God, even when they're following his regulations, what does he really want from us? He wants us to do what he says. That's what he wants. That's the bottom line. He wants us to do what he says. So when he gives this uh, final verdict in Scripture, obedience is better than sacrifice, and to love God and to love your neighbor is better or more than all the other observances of the law. In fact, Jesus would say that the law and the prophets hang on these, these commands. Because they're primary. Here's a good example. Have y'all read the Ten Commandments? Anybody want to stand up right now and recite all Ten Commandments in order? Anybody feel confident? Nobody? No takers? All right. Well, let's just start at the beginning. Because here's the good example. There is structure to the Ten Commandments. They're not just random, okay? 
There's 10 of them, but they're in a particular order. So let's, let's just go through them real quick. What's the first one? You'll have no other gods, right? No other gods. If you want to cheat, you can go to Exodus, Exodus chapter 20, and you can get a little cheat sheet. Love God, love your neighbor, right? So now, now let's talk about the Ten Commandments. The first one, no other gods. What's the second one? No idols, right? No, make no graven images, right? What's the third one? Anybody remember the third one? Come on. Somebody turn to Exodus 20. The third one is not taking the names of the Lord in vain. The fourth one is remember the Sabbath. Keep it holy. Okay? All right, let's stop right there. So the, so the first four, the first four, no other gods, no idols, re revere the name of the Lord and revere the day of the Lord, right? So you have no gods, no idols, don't take the name of the Lord in vain. Remember the Sabbath. Now, what do all those have in common? Gold star for Miss Brown. Yes. You're guilty. You're on the video now. Sorry. Uh, so, they all have to do with our relationship with God. That's a, a vertical. Okay? Now, where do we go when we go to number five? Honor your father and mother. How about number six, seven, and eight? Don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal. And how about nine and ten? False witness and coveting, right? So from five to ten, now what do we have? Yes, go ahead, you can say it out loud, they won't hear you. Yes, so, so you go from five to ten is your relationship with other people. Now, you have relationship with God, relationship with others. Now, where does that sound familiar? We just read it, <laughs> right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor, right? God, others. It's, it's just like the Ten Commandments. So that's why Jesus is summarizing and, and condensing this down because honestly, if we don't get the first, really the first two, but, but the first four of the Ten Commandments, if we don't get those right, then once we get to the, the next six commandments, we're going to have a real big struggle because our re vertical relationship is skewed. So then our horizontal relationships are going to be skewed. The, the, they go hand in hand. That's why, that's why Jesus said, do you remember what he said about the Ten Commandments? Do you remember what he said about the... the um, let's see, I'm trying to remember the parable. Or maybe just been an encounter. When he said, if you, if you break the law at any point, you're guilty of it all. So, why would he say that? That's right. That's right. If you don't keep the first four, that's why they're first. Right? If you don't keep the first four, then the last six aren't going to happen. They're not going to matter. Because you've already broken the fellowship in your vertical relationship. So, your relationship with God is what leads you to your relationship with other people. So when Jesus answers this scribe in this particular passage and says the most important, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and in your mind and all your strength. And the second one, commandments 5 through 10, love your neighbor as yourself. And so... They're, those are the most important, and they go together. So, even the most sacred duties, in other words, will not take precedence over love. So, when he told, when he told this scribe the answer, and the scribe then um, interpreted his answer as including that little piece at the end of verse 33, the more important than burnt offerings and sacrifices... In other words, if we don't love God and love people, then all the service, all the work, all the giving, all the other appearances will lose all their meaning and value because our love is messed up. 
Does that make sense? That's the primary thing. And all the other things are supposed to flow out of that. Because if they don't express the love with God and the love with others, then they're just, they're, they're vain. That's the earthly observation. And the last part is in verse 34, the heavenly observation. Jesus then sees what the scribe says. You had the scribe kind of passing judgment on Jesus and his answer. Well, now Jesus observes something about the scribe's answer. And he judges it, he judges it to be wise. And this is what he says at the very end. You are not far from the kingdom of God. Now, when humans dare to sit in judgment on the claims of Jesus, what they find instead is that Jesus is really sitting in judgment on them. And that's, that's not a comfortable position. So this scribe was trying to say, oh, yeah, you, you, you did well on that, Jesus. Good answer. But then Jesus was actually sizing him up the whole time. And so when Jesus sits in judgment on us, it's either going to be, you're going to either be self-condemned or you're going to be justified by your attitude towards Jesus. And it's not surprising that after this, the last phrase, the last sentence, no one dared to question him anymore because everybody's listening. See, you, it's like in school. You know what happens every single time if two people start arguing? It's just two individuals, two people, two people arguing. What's the first thing that happens when people uh, hear or look and see that people, two people are arguing? They run to it, right? And the next thing you know, it's a crowd of people. Ooh, what's going to happen next? And then in today's day and age, it's, let me video it, you know. Oh, he, he needs help. Well, I'm not going to help him. I'm too busy videoing it. Put it on YouTube, you know. Our, our world is, is messed up. But that's the point, see. In this situation, can you imagine the drama of one individual being bold enough to walk up to Jesus after all those other groups have come and failed and, and been sent running away with their tail between their legs and now this one guy is going to come up here and, and dare to ask Jesus a question so everybody's crowded around. Let me hear what happens. Let me see what happens, right? So when Jesus pronounces this last statement, you are not far from the kingdom of God, nobody else wanted to say another word see the scribe can judge whether or not somebody is faithful to the torah because i'm sure he knew you know he knew the first five books he knew the the scriptures because of his position but jesus see Ju jesus uh supersedes the torah he supersedes every confession and every formula and every answer that we could possibly give so you draw near to the kingdom of god not by giving the right theological answer you draw near to the kingdom of god by getting close to jesus right that's why it was so important love god love people love god love people that's the the summary of all the law and the prophets of what jesus was teaching the people so when we're talking about um priorities here priorities Christians don't have the luxury of choosing for themselves what is important to God and what's not important to God. See, that's, that's the one, um, I don't know, it's like a, it's a, um, it's a really, really good benefit about following Jesus. It takes all the pressure off of trying to determine, well, I wonder what's, is this right, or is this pleasing, or is this wrong? Or, you don't have to determine that. You know why? He has already told us. So the following Jesus takes the pressure off of having to make those decisions. We just The decision we need to make is, am I going to do it or not? Am I going to listen or not? Not, well, is this right or is this wrong? Well, we just read the Bible. And, and we just then we have to make the determination, I'm going to do what it says or not. I'm going to do what it says. So our responsibility is to obey. So the purpose of studying 
a passage like this is hopefully to kind of uh, reorient our hearts, our souls, our minds, all our strength, point it towards loving God and loving others. So, why do we look at this passage tonight? What, what, um, what direct benefit might it have for us? If we're, if we're going to be faithful to Scripture, if we're going to be faithful to what God has called us to do as a church, but also as individual believers, if we're going to do that, then it's almost like you, we need to, every so often, we need to kind of recalibrate and kind of go back to the, the basic truth of wh what is our purpose, right? If you, don't, if you don't evaluate every so often, then you might get on down the road and, and be way off course, and, and you might not realize it till it's, then it's a lot farther to correct, right? If you're going on a trip, if you're driving cross-country, ought to check the map from time to time, right? Or you end up going... Uh, you make one wrong turn, you can end up 400 miles out of the way, and then if you hadn't checked the map periodically, then you, know, you could catch it before it gets too far out of balance. Well, it's the same thing with the church. Yes, oh, that's a perfect illustration. If you don't hang the plumb line, and you don't see that it, everything is level, square, like it's supposed to be with this, I mean, Jesus said this, his, his word is the plumb line that he dropped. That's his standard. And so if you don't have a standard, uh, then, then you won't know how far off you are. So every so often, we need to come back to just the basic truth. What's our purpose? Why do we exist as a church? Why do I follow Jesus to begin with? What's, what's he want me to do, you know? And then what's he want us to do? Well, in simplest terms, love God. Love people. Make disciples. I'm going to show you, show you a trick. Look at your prayer list. Everybody look at your prayer list. Look right up there at the top. Those words are tiny under, up underneath those pictures. Do you know what they say? It says love God. It says love people. It says make disciples. Look on your bulletin from Sunday. See that same picture a little bit bigger? What's it say? Love God. Love people. Make disciples. You know why? Because we need to write it on our doorpost. We need to write it on our city gates. We need to write it across our forehead if we need to, or on our hands, or talk about it when we're at home. Talk about it when we're eating supper. Talk about it when we're at church. Talk about it when we lie down at night and when we wake up in the morning. What are we supposed to be doing? Love God. Love people. Make disciples. And, and I'm going to tell you why that's so important. That, this will be the last thing I say. The reason why that is so important is because there are hundreds of things that we could do. As a church, there's hundreds of things we could do. But there's only a, a few things that we absolutely have to do or else we, we ought not to call ourselves a church. And those things are on the list of things that we have to do. We have to gather. No matter what, and no matter what anybody says, you know, don't don't tell me the church can't can't meet. We have to gather. We have to read and study the Bible. We have to pray. We have to baptize believers. We have to observe communion at the Lord's Supper. 
we have to love God. We have to love people, and we have to make disciples. If we don't do those, those are the things that we have to do. If we're going to continue to have the word church after Berlin Baptist, then that's the stuff we have to do. Now, all the other things, how, well, what ministries should we be doing or what, what ministries would best serve our community? How would we reach the most people, you know? Well, those are open to discussion. And they could change from time to time. Did you know that? Baptists are really good at starting stuff, but terrible at stopping it. That's the, that's the God's honest truth. Every, most, most, most Baptist, I can't speak for other churches, but most Baptist churches, at least the ones I've been a part of, come up with some good ideas and, and some new stuff to start. And once you start it, though, it's almost like it's an unwritten rule. All right, we're going to do this till Jesus comes back. Whether it's still working or not, we're gonna keep, we started it, we've got to keep doing it. Well, that's not really true. That's why you evaluate, right? Because the things you do, the way you reach people, the different ministries you're involved in, they, those can change from time to time. That's okay. That's not, that's not against the Bible. But those other things, they can't change. Those things have to keep going and keep being done. Does that make sense? Yeah, right. I mean, we have a good, uh, 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 almost an uncommon talent of complicating things, you know, when it's really much more simple than what we make it out to be. And so if we, if we would just continue to evaluate, go back to the book and say, what is it we have to do? And then what is it that we could do or not do? We can, we can decide, but we gotta got to preach the word. we got to baptize believers. we got to observe the Lord's Supper. We've got to love God, and we've got to love people and make disciples. And that's, that's what I want us to do. And it's not because it's my idea. I want us to do it because that's what God said we're supposed to do. And I want, I want God to be pleased with us because we're doing what he says. That, that's what I want more than anything. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your word, and thank you for your direction. And I pray because of your grace and mercy and your strength uh, at work in us that you'll empower us to, to obey and, and do what you tell us to do and not be afraid to evaluate and see how we're doing. And, and if we need to make some adjustments along the way, that you'll help us do that. But ultimately, I pray that we will do what you tell us to do, that we'll love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, that we'll love our neighbors as ourselves, and that we'll make disciples of all nations. In Jesus' name, amen.